Uh, well, man, I'm so glad you're here this morning. If you're a guest with us and haven't had a chance to meet you, my name's Matt Darby. I get to be our pastor here uh, for the Gilmer campus of New Beginnings. If you don't know much about New Beginnings, let me tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we're one church, but we have uh, three campuses in Longview here in Gilmer, and we also have our Spanish campus. And uh, man, I'm so thankful that you're here today. If you're a guest, I hope you feel right at home. Uh, I hope you're able to uh, find where everything is. If you have a question about us, if you have a question about where restrooms are, where your kids go, or, or just what it means to belong here. Uh, our staff has uh, name tags, find one of them. We have some wonderful people who have some lanyards on uh, that say welcome on it. They can answer any question that you have. Um, but I just want you to hear from me. I'm really thankful that you came today, and uh, we're just honored to have you a part of what, of what we're doing. And uh, for all of you, man, I'm excited about where we are as a church. I'm excited to, to be moving forward in this series where God has bringing us. We're in our last week, our third and last week of our series uh, called Legacy, where we're looking at the legacy that God is calling us to build and calling us to invest in and calling us uh, to leave. Uh, we're at a significant moment. I've said it every week. We're at a significant moment in the life of our church. We're at a significant moment here. We, we see all that God has done. We see all that God is doing. We see how he is moving in us now and, and how he has moved in us. And I feel like now, as a campus, we're kind of looking over the precipice <laughs> into what God is calling us to do. And we're like, oh man, this is, this is significant, right? This is significant. And God is calling us and it is no small thing for us to step out and to build this worship center that God is calling us to build and this additional life group space and that we desperately need and to open up these other spaces in our building to minister to our kids, which is growing, and our students, which is, is growing. And as we do that, I want to tell you now, it is going to take every single one of us. Amen. Every single one of us. Um, this is an all-skate event at New Beginnings. If, you, if this is your spiritual home, whether you're a member or not, if you call this place home, it's going to take every single one of us. As I thought about that this week, I was, I was reminded of uh, a mission trip that uh, we went on uh, with our church when I was a teenager. And you may have heard this story, so if you have, I just need you to act like Carrie, who's heard all my stories, and just pretend like you've never heard it. That'll be really sweet. <laughs> just, just be really sweet about it, okay? Uh, but... We were in Oklahoma, and we were working with this small church, and there was, we were getting a new portion of a, of a church built for them, but there was this part of the building that they had that we were trying to move up to where the new stuff was being built. And it wasn't large. It was, it was basically the size of a large room, but we didn't want to tear it down. So what they wanted to do was take off the exterior walls. And, and our team, just we, were, we had enough people with us. Everybody just get around, get some big guys at the corners. Everybody find your spot. And we're going to lift this building up and walk it up the hill and set it by the new building. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And so everybody's getting around, and, and high school Matt, you know, he gets in there, and I was smelling myself by that time. I was pretty sure I was the business, and I was just, yeah, let's go. Everybody see? I ripped my shirt off, and you see I got no sleeves. Everybody notice sun's out, gun's out. Here we go, right? <laughs> so we're, we're, we're moving this building, and I noticed to my right and my left, I got a couple of pretty big guys, some grown men, you know, and I think to myself, I wonder what would happen if I just kind of let my arms fall, you know, because I was always looking for a reason to quit something. And so uh, I kind of <laughs> kind of just let my arms fall, and I noticed the building didn't fall. They were still moving forward, and I thought, man, you guys don't need me. You got it. What I didn't know is when I let my arms fall, immediately it created an undue, unnecessary, and unfair weight and pressure on these two guys to my left and right, and they immediately felt it when I dropped my arms. They knew instantly, right? They started yelling, right? And where I grew up as the preacher's kid, everybody got to treat you like you were their kid. That's just the way it was. And so immediately they were yelling at me, but Darby, put your hands on the building. Let's go, right? And I didn't realize that when I kind of dropped my arms and just thought, oh, they got it, what happened was I put an undue, unnecessary, and unfair weight on them, and 
I was missing the moment, missing the opportunity, and missing the joy of getting that building to the top of the mission, to the top of the hill, and being a part of the mission. I, would have, I was missing it. There is a tendency in many of us already to look around our church and go, listen, there's people with more than I got. There's people, they got better means. They have more resources. We're just going to, they got it. We're going to let them handle it. You got it. We, we're going to cheer them on. We're going to pray for them, but, but they've got it. We're going to let them have it. And I'm telling you, what that's going to do is put an unnecessary strain and an unfair weight on others because this is not a moment to, to only look and cheer someone else on. This is a moment where you link arms and we get this building up the hill together. That's what this is. And not only will it create something unnecessary on other brothers and sisters and families around you, but you will miss the joy of, of the mission. That moment when it sits out there on that lot, you will miss the joy of having had the opportunity to sacrificially give with everybody else and make it happen. This is the time where we link arms together. It's going to take every single one of us. And I've said it every week, and I'm saying it now. I'm going to put it on the screen, and you're going to say it with me. Ready? Now is the time, and we're ready for this. Now is the time. We're ready for this. This season of growing, this season of unbelievable things that God has done over the last seven years um, in our campus, listen, this is, this is nothing new for New Beginnings. It has been our story from day one that God has been pouring out on us and doing things among us and increasing us and causing us to outgrow whatever we were in. That's been our story from day one. I don't know if you know this, but New Beginnings turned 40 years old this year. Did you know that? Our church started in June of 1993, and in June of 2023, we turned 40 years old as a church. And listen, for 40 years, God has been pouring out. As a matter, matter of fact, I have a picture of the very first gathering that happened of New Beginnings. Look at this. Now, some of you can tell that's 1983 because you see them hairdos, and they are on point, right? 1983, June of 1983. That is in the backyard of a, a, a couple named Lynn and Linda Spruill. And um, they had gathered in that backyard about 65 people. That's where we started, right there. Um, there are people in that picture who are still a part of our church. There are children that were sitting in laps that day that have raised their children here and have come to know the Lord. They came to know the Lord, and their children have come to know the Lord here. Matter of fact, if you go uh, one, two, three rows back and two seats in, you're going to see a man sitting with his elbows forward and sunglasses on. You know who that is? That's our elder uh, named uh, Wayne McFall. Uh, and so Wayne looks like he's in the Secret Service in that picture. But <laughs> from that moment, God started a legacy of faithfulness and generosity and trust, and we're standing in it right now. That's where it started, that day. I want you to hear me say this. They didn't have a building. They didn't know what God was going to do. They didn't know how this thing was going to work out. All they knew was God had stirred something in them. They knew they were dreaming away in new ways that God was using them. They knew God was at work, and they knew God was calling them to new things and great things, and He's still working. He's still at work among us. More than ever, He has His hand on us. More than ever, we're seeing Him save. More than ever, we're seeing Him renew believers. We're seeing Him heal. We're seeing Him raise up disciples. And God is calling us now the way He called us in 1983 to trust Him and to be courageous and to join Him in the new thing that He's doing. And I am supremely confident of this church that what he has done in the past seven years here and in the past 40 years from that day, what he has done is not all he wants to do. I'm supremely confident of that. As wonderful, as amazing as the last 40 years and the last seven years have been, that what God is going to do in the future is beyond anything any one of us can even dream or imagine. How do I know that? 
Because when he described himself in his word, he described himself as the God who can do infinitely above all that we could ever ask or imagine. That's what I believe he's calling us to do. And listen, so here's our job. Our job is to be ready. Our job is to be ready to join him. Right? So in order to help us be ready, there's some really important things that are coming up in the next two weeks. Things that start really t tomorrow night. And I want to put all of these in front of you at, at one time. Um, if you want to take a picture of this, we're going to be talking about it today. We'll talk about it next week as well. Just some really important dates that are coming for our church. Here's the first one. Tomorrow night and Tuesday night, we're going to have what we're calling legacy, a legacy vision event. For many of you, you're, you're hearing us talk about this and you're thinking, man, what is, what's this thing going to look like? What's this building going to look like? And what does it mean for this rest of this building? And when do we get to start? And what's all this ask about you know, making a commitment? And you've got questions about this. And I want to tell you, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, we're going to meet in the student room. And anyone who would like to come and discover what this thing is, look at the, the renderings that we have, talk about a timetable, talk about what this commitment is, ask questions. This event is tomorrow night at 6 o'clock or Tuesday night. It's the same event. We're just going to do it two times in a row. We want to create as much opportunity as we can for anyone who just goes, I just want to know more, right? I just want to know more. That's what this is. Uh, tomorrow night and Tuesday night, I want to invite you. Come to one of those. Ask any question. Uh, I doubt you'll ask a question I haven't already been asked, but I want you to feel equipped and ready to join God in what He's doing. Next Sunday, the 8th at 1230, um, we're going to offer just a little light lunch class for anyone that wants to come called Generosity, Where Do I Begin? Here's why I wanted to do that. By the way, I'm going to have Pastor Brad and his precious wife, Stephanie, lead that. If you know Pastor Brad and Stephanie, um, you know they are, God has just gifted them to think creatively about stuff like family budgets. He just has. Um, I don't know, you may be in a place where uh, Carrie and I have been, which is where we look at our family budget, but we also look at the call to be obedient in generosity, and we go, okay, we acknowledge God calls us to do this. I'm looking at my family budget, and I don't know how to get from here to there. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to make margin for generosity. I feel like that what we have is, is all that we have, and it requires all that we have to do what must be done. We don't feel like we live above our means, and we don't know how to get from where we are to make margin for generosity. That's what this class is for. I'm telling you, Carrie and I have had to sit down with people who said, let's just talk about how to create margin. So if you're at a place you're going, I know we should, but I don't know how. We're going to have a light lunch. I'm going to be there. We're going to sit. We're going to hang out. And it's just going to be an opportunity for somebody who has some understanding to help us create that. So if you need that, I want you to be there, right? On that Sunday, the 8th, we're going to have our commitment cards. They're going to go out, right? I've been talking about this. I've been talking about generosity. I've been talking about this thing. I've been saying we're getting ready to make a commitment. Commitment cards are going out on the 8th. We're going to put those in your hand. We're going to make those available. Now, listen, I don't want any commitments on the 8th. None. Because starting the 9th, I'm going to call our church into a week of prayer and fasting. And before we do anything spiritual or financial, we're going to do what we need to do spiritually, right? Which we're going to spend a week praying. I want you, you're going to take that card home and you're going to pray. And you're going to get a chance to register for the fast. And when you do, we have a fasting guide that's available to you. And some of you are going, a week of fasting? Uh, that sounds like I may die. Pastor, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> Right? We believe in prayer and fasting here. We believe that when we set aside time to intentionally pray and we give up things that we desire to create a hunger for God, He meets us in that place and He speaks to us. And so I'm inviting you to do that. When you register, you're going to get access to a fasting guide that will show you different ways to fast. You know, for some of you, you may go, man, I am, I'm going to fast from lunch every day this week and I'm going to spend that hour in prayer. For some of you, you may think, man, I'm fasting from from this type of food, from every, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast, you know, from Snickers. So uh, it's a very meaningful thing. No, I'm kidding, right? <laughs> what, there's all kinds of ways to fast. But I'm inviting you into a week of prayer and fasting to pray over that commitment card. And then on October the 15th, we will bring those in. We're calling that Commitment Sunday. And as God has spoken to your heart, you'll, with us, we'll make our commitments. I just wanted you to see that because I want you to hear me say, our job is to be ready to join God in what he's doing. 
Our job is to recognize he's at work, he's moving, he's calling us to this. So what do we need to do to be ready to be a part of it? Right? I'm not going to just look back and go, they've got it, they've got more than I do, go get it, slugger. Nope. Arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, we're going to move this up the hill together. Okay? All right. I wanted you to see that. So week one, we talked about, two weeks ago, we talked about what does it look like to build and leave a legacy of faithfulness. We said in order to do that, we have to know and treasure God personally, and then we have to desire for the next generation to experience more of Him than we have, right? Last week, we looked at what does it mean to leave a legacy of generosity. We said generosity that leaves a legacy is sacrificial, it's wholehearted, it's humble, it's willing, it's above and beyond, right? It recognizes we give the tithe, but it's, a, it's an above and beyond that uh, generosity, and this week, we're going to look at what does it mean to leave a legacy of trust, a legacy of trust. I want to tell you, from the very beginning, God has always called his people and brought his people into seasons of greater courage, greater faith, and greater trust in him. We're going to look at one of those moments in Isaiah 43. If you have your Bible, go ahead and head that direction. Isaiah 43, this is... Uh, just a be- I would encourage you sometime this week, just read Isaiah 43. Man, is it beautiful. Such a powerful chapter in the Bible. But God is calling his people in this chapter to, to look ahead with him, to look forward with him, and to do it with a confident hope. Right? And so what he does is starting in verse 1, really through about verse 13, uh, he is calling them, well, even 14 and 15 and 16, he's calling them to remember all that he is, all that he's done for them, all that he has accomplished on their behalf. And so if you start in verse 1, you start seeing him say things like, I am the Lord, your God. I am um, your Redeemer. I created you. I formed you. I redeemed you. I called you by name. I love you and I'm, I'm with you. He says over in verse you know, four, five, six, and seven. You don't have to be afraid because you're my sons, you're my daughters, and I've made you for my glory. You get into verse 13, and he starts to say things like, um, I am the only God. There is no Savior besides me. There is no God before me. I am God. And everything that God is about to call them to do, he does with all that he is and all that he's done ringing in their hearts. And I want to tell you new beginnings. Everything God is calling us to do, everything God is calling us forward to run after and accomplish and trust, we are doing with all that he is and all that he has already done ringing in our hearts. Why? Because the God who has been faithful the last seven years, the last 40 years, the last 4,000 years is the God who is going to be faithful to us when we step out with him into the unknown. He's the God that's going to be faithful to us when we step out with him into the unknown. I want to pick it up in verse 14. So Isaiah 43, verse 14. If you're there, let me hear you say, the Bible is true. true. Amen. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans in the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Now what's he talking about? What moment in history comes to mind when they're right there? When he says, I made a way in the sea. I made a way in the waters, and the horse and the chariot, they came forward, but they drowned and I quenched them. What's he talking about? Talking about Egypt, right? Talking about their deliverance. He's talking about crossing the sea, swallowing up Pharaoh's army. So he says, I've done this in verse 18, but remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. For behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beast will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people who I form, whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. 
a legacy of trust is going to require that we do more than remember and celebrate what God has done. It requires that we look forward in faith to the new thing he wants to do. So I want to say this. If we want, there's really just two ideas today, two big ideas. If we want to leave a legacy of trust in God, the first thing is we have to be willing to, to glance back with appreciation, but to gaze forward in expectation. Right? To look back with appreciation and thanksgiving, but to set our gaze forward in expectation. Right? If you look at verse 16 and 17, God reminds them of Egypt. He reminds them of his redemption, how he delivered them and set them free from 400 years of slavery. He's like, hey, you remember when Pharaoh was bearing down on you? You remember when you were caught between an ocean and an army? You remember that moment when you were hopeless? And I came in and I split the water and you walked across, but the moment they put their toe in it, I swallowed them up. You remember that? Yeah, God, it was awesome. Good. Verse 18, remember not the former things. Do not consider the things of old. What? What do you mean? Remember not, remember not the former things. This is maybe the most pivotal moment in the history of God's people, and he says, don't remember the former things. Man, this was their Super Bowl, right? This was their, this was their victory against all odds. It'd be like me looking at the most diehard Cowboys fan who has endured the last 30 years of drought, 25 years of drought, and saying, hey, you remember 1993 and 94 and 96? Yeah, they were awesome. They were on grid. Remember not the former things. Don't even think about that anymore. What? But that was, that was the glory days. We'll never see anything like that happen again, right? Yeah, we probably won't. But God, God is looking to his people. And in this moment, he reminds them of Egypt. And then you know what he says? Egypt's not the end of the story I'm writing in your life. Egypt's not the last great thing I want to do among you. And there's a day, as amazing and as wonderful as that was, that's not all. And there's a danger for us to look back on our last 70, seven years, excuse me, our last seven years, and see 500 plus people who've come to faith. 640 people who have been baptized, a church that's doubled in size in seven years, and to go, man, and to get comfortable. Man, that was awesome. That was, that was amazing. We're going to just rejoice in that, and we're going to get comfortable in that victory. And, we're gonna, we, and then we, what happens is we start to act like what we have seen we'll never see again. And I want you to hear me say, the last seven years is something we should be grateful for. It's something that we should look back with appreciation and thanksgiving and gratitude in our hearts. But the last seven years is not all that God wants to do. It's not even the beginning of what God wants to do. When God said, remember not the former things, he wasn't saying what I've done in the past is unimportant. He wasn't saying what I've done and accomplished for you in the past isn't wonderful and you, you should act like it never happened. That's not what he's saying. God is calling us to see that what he is doing and where he is leading requires that we look forward, not stare backward. Our best days are not behind us. They are ahead of us. And when we look back at the past seven years and the past 40 years, we look back with joy, but we fix our eyes forward. We do not live in the past. God is doing something new. He wants to do more ahead of us than he's done behind us. And if we only know how to look back, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. This isn't just true for our church. It's true in your life. God wants to do things ahead of your life that are greater than the things he's done already in your life. And you may be in a season where you're going, man, I still know about that. I don't know. I don't. God's calling you right now. Come on, step out into the unknown. I dare you to trust me with courage. Right? 
two things came to my mind when I thought about this idea that we can look back with appreciation, but we got to gaze forward with, with expectation, anticipating God is going to move. Two things come to mind. Here's the first one. We can't expect past victories to sustain us. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? We cannot expect past victories to sustain us. All right, I'm going to put a picture up in just a minute. Don't, don't put it up yet. I'm going to put it up in just a minute. When I do, I need the hands to go up who know who this is because I need to know who the other weirdos in the room are, okay? <laughs> what a, it's going to go up, and when it goes up, you just raise your hand if you know who this is. Okay, let's put it up. Who knows who that is? Yes. All right, who is it? What's his name? That's Uncle Rico. That's right. That's Uncle Rico. That's who that is. Those of you who don't know who that is, uh, you need to watch a movie called Napoleon Dynamite and join the cult, all right? It's a cult. We're in it. It's great. It's a funny movie. My wife despises this movie. <laughs> I, here's what I found about this movie. There's no middle ground. I've not met anyone that goes, oh, it's okay. I've, I, it's only people who are in the cult or people who are trying to deliver us out of the cult. They either love it or hate it, right? Here's the deal with Uncle Rico. Uncle Rico only, I, I call it Uncle Rico syndrome. He only knew how to live in the past, right? Yeah. He peaked in high school, and he was like, man, I, if they would have just made me the quarterback, we would have won state every year, and I could throw a football over a mountain. He just says a bunch of stupid stuff, and he's stuck in the past. He's, he's, and here's what I want to tell you. Church, listen. The past is a great place to learn, and it is a terrible place to live. Are you with me? The past is a great place to learn. It is a terrible place to live. And you, in your life and in this church, we cannot expect past victories to sustain us for what God's calling us to do. Here's the other thing that just was kind of ringing in my heart. We can't allow past failures to paralyze us. We can't allow past failures to paralyze us. What happened after they crossed that Red Sea? What were the next 40 years like for them? Wandered in the wilderness. A journey that should have taken them 15 to 20 days took them 40 years. You want to know why? That is an epic failure of faith. An epic failure of faith. They missed it. They didn't trust God. They didn't believe he was working in the unknown. And they didn't know how to step out and follow him into it. And what should have taken two weeks took them 40 years. Listen, some of us in this room, we have some pretty epic failures in our past. We do. We, I do. You do. You may be looking at failures in your past and going, man. I would give anything to not have made that decision. I would give anything if that wasn't a part of my story. Right? And if we're looking at a past victory to sustain us, or we're allowing a past failure to paralyze us, we will never open our arms to embrace the new thing God's calling us to do. We will miss where we're going because we won't know how to let go of where we were. Try driving your car forward and only looking in the rearview mirror. It's not going to go well. God is calling us forward. And we've seen some amazing victories and we've had some failures. And the victories aren't going to sustain us, but the failures can't paralyze us. We are being called into a new thing. New measures of trust, new measures of courage. I, I came across some folks, you're going to know all these people, but I find their stories fascinating who had so many failures before they finally had kind of that breakthrough moment. I think about uh, Walt Disney comes to mind. He was actually fired from one of his first jobs and was told by his boss that he had no imagination. <laughs> right, it's the guy that created Mickey Mouse. Told by his first boss, you have no imagination. Right? <laughs> think about Stephen King, Right? I know there's some of you that read those heathen books. You can't lie to me. Um, <laughs> Stephen King's first manuscript was rejected by 30 publishers. 30. But the 31st said yes. 
And from that moment, he's written 72 books and is one of the most famous authors in the world. I think about one of my, my personal heroes, someone I really look up to, and you'll probably know why, named Colonel Sanders. He, uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> oh, we're like this, me and the colonel. He, uh, at 62 years old, he had $105 in his wallet, and he had a recipe. And he, he didn't know what else to do, so he just goes restaurant to restaurant to restaurant to restaurant, trying to get somebody to buy into this and be a part of this. And according to him, he was told no over a thousand times. But one little restaurant in Utah said, all right, we'll try it. And KFC was, was born. Um, isn't that crazy? Think about one more. Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb, right? Literally, maybe one of the most important inventions in history. But what he, if you read his memoirs and you read his history, what you find out is there were so many failures that led up to what we call our light bulb. And when he was asked about those failures, you know what he said? He said, I didn't, I didn't have 10,000 failures. I found 10,000 things that didn't work until I found the one that did. Now, but think about, let's dial into one of the pillars of our faith. Let's look at Paul for a minute. Paul had unbelievable victories in his life. Before Paul came to Christ, though, Paul had epic failures. Epic failures. He even had some misses after he came to Christ. But when he knew that the church needed to be called forward, and he knew that what God wanted to do in him was not behind him, it was ahead of him, he said this in Philippians 3. He says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, Paul knew what God was calling him to do would not be sustained by yesterday's victories and it must not be paralyzed by yesterday's failures. A legacy of trust is going to look back with joy, look back with appreciation, look back with gratitude, but it is going to set its gaze forward with anticipation and with expectation that God is not done. We want to have a legacy of trust. We have to have to do that. Here's here's the next thing. If we want to leave a, leave a legacy of trust, we have to be ready. Listen, to follow God into the unknown with confidence. To follow God into the unknown with confidence. Our theme verse is Isaiah forty three nineteen. Let's read it again. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We landed on this verse as our theme verse for the legacy series and the legacy initiative because it calls us out. It calls us out to, to come and step out with God and to trust God. It calls us to step out into the unknown with God. It calls God's people to respond to him in faith and know that he's going to respond to us with his presence and with his power. I love this verse because it speaks to God's desire and it speaks to God's ability to bring about a new beginning in our lives. Some of you in this morning that are in this room this morning, you know you're in a spot and you desperately want a new beginning with God. He wants that. I love this verse because it speaks to his desire to do new works among us, to display his glory and his power in new ways. It affirms his desire to take us further with him and to use us to do more through him and for him than we ever thought possible. I want you to hear me say this new beginnings. The only lid on what God can do among us here is our willingness to follow him into the unknown with confidence. That's the only lid. The only lid to what God wants to accomplish among us in this place is our willingness to step out into the unknown with Him. That's it. That's always been the lid for God's people, right? I mean, His power is perfect, yes? 
His strength is perfect. He knows all. His love is perfect. Well, if all of that is true, then when He calls us forward, the only thing that hinders Him doing more than we could ever ask or imagine is our willingness to step out with Him. Think about Abraham. God looks at this man and He says, Abraham, I want you to go to a land that you've never been. As a matter of fact, you don't even know where it is. I'm going to have to show you. You're going to have to take your family. I don't want you to uproot everything. And I want you to go to this place you've, you've never known. Wait a minute. What do you mean? God, I have a, I have a whole thing going on here. I've, I've got roots here. My, my family's here. I, I don't know the way. I don't know how we're going to live. I, I don't know how to do that. And God goes, I know. But I want you to come follow me into the unknown. Because when you step out, I want you to know I'm already there. I'm already working to bless you, to bless your family, and to bless my people for generations to come. God looked at Moses and he said, he said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. And I want you to tell him that the slave labor he's depended on for 400 years is about to walk out that gate. Would you go let him know that? Moses, what? What? God, I can't even speak. I'm a nobody. I've got nothing. I have no, I'm not a leader. I don't have any skills. I can't go do that. And God goes, I know. But I want you to step out into the unknown with me. Because when you do, you're going to find I'm already at work there. And I'm shifting the heart of that man to accomplish a deliverance for my people that will establish my identity in their hearts for the rest of of their lives. I think about a guy we don't talk about enough named Gideon. You remember God's call to Gideon? He says, Gideon, I want you to go. You're going to make war on the Midianites and you're going to stop them from taking everything from my people, which they're doing. And Gideon goes, wait a minute. That's a, that's a mighty army. It's a mighty, they're vicious. They're powerful. And I'm a farmer. I'm a nobody. I don't know how to go do that. God goes, I know. But I want you to come step out with me into the unknown. And this army that Israel has of 32,000 people, I'm going to pare it down to 300, and I'm going to accomplish a victory on behalf of my people that they'll never forget. And over and over and over and over it goes. God calls men and women to step out into the unknown. And listen, every time there's that moment where they go, what? You want me to do what? You want me to give what? You want me to go say what? And God goes, I know, but I want you to step out with me into the unknown because I'm already at work out in front of you and I'll use this moment of your obedience to do things you cannot imagine. Jesus looked at his disciples and what did he say? I want you to come follow me. Jesus Look, you're great and all, man, but we got jobs. We got families. We got responsibilities. I got kids over here. What do you mean come and follow you? How are we going to live? What are we going to do? I know. But I want you to come step out into the unknown with me. Because if you do, I'm going to use the obedience of you 12 men to change the world forever. Jesus is calling us now. He is calling this church right now. He is calling every believer in this room right now to step out, to leave a legacy of faithfulness and generosity and trust. And some of us, it's in our heart, we're going, God, we've never done this before. That's me, by the way. We've never done this before. You've never asked us to trust you like this before. We've never given this way before. We've never been generous like this before. How do we know if we're going to make it? How do we know if we can do it? I know. But I want you to come follow me into the unknown. Because I want to use this moment of your obedience to raise up generation after generation of spirit-filled, spirit-led, God-glorifying, Jesus-loving disciples who transformed their world for my glory. God is always calling His people to greater measures of faith and trust. 
And when we step out into the unknown, we may not know where God's going, but we don't step out blindly. We step out knowing what we do not know, he knows fully. We step out knowing what, when we're not sure how this is going to work out, he knows fully how it's going to work out. And because he's all-knowing and because he's all-powerful, we can trust that he knows the future that he has for this church. He knows the future that he has for your life for your family, your children. And the plans that he has made for us are a million times better than the plans we've made for ourselves. Right? I'm going to put these statements on the screen. It needs to be a whole nother sermon, but I don't have 45 more minutes. Thank the Lord. His plan, listen, his plan is perfect. His timing is perfect. His motives are perfect, and his heart of love toward us is perfect. Pastor Matt, I, I'm in this place, man. I see our family budget. I see the call to be generous. I don't know how to do this. Good. Come on, step out with us into the unknown. Because God's plan is perfect. God's timing is perfect. His motives are perfect. And his heart of love toward you and your family in this church is perfect. New Beginnings, I believe with all my heart, God is calling us to great things, greater things than we have seen, greater things than we can imagine. And we are stepping into a season where it is time for us to anticipate He is doing something great. And when we do, when we step out into the unknown, He promises, I'm going to join you there. I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to come with you. I'm going to equip you. I'm going to provide for you. And the only question that I need ringing in your heart right here is what in the world would hold me back from stepping out? What would hold me back? That it doesn't make sense in my mind? It's never made sense in our human minds. To step out in faith and trust God. Just let me, let's take a pen, pop the bubble. It will never make sense to walk in full surrender to Jesus. It will always be hard. It will always demand faith. It will always call you to, to submit more than you're comfortable submitting. Always, every time. And if it's too easy, it's probably not obedience. He's calling us forward. So we have to rest in and the realities that Jesus is enough. Let me ask you, do you really believe Jesus is enough to sustain you and your family? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that his grace is sufficient for whatever he calls you to? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that his mercy is steadfast and will walk with you in every moment of obedience? Do you really believe that his provision is perfect? And he will provide. Do you really believe that his love never fails? Do you really believe that his presence is all we need? If we believe that, then what God calls you to do in the next two weeks, which is going to challenge your faith, challenge your heart, you can step out into the unknown with him because he's already at work. He's already at work. All right, here's what I want us to do. I want us to spend some time in worship and in prayer. And maybe this morning, um, when I said some, some of you may need a new beginning with God, maybe that's you. Maybe you're a believer and, and you love Jesus, but you feel bone dry right now. And the thought of opening your hands in generosity, you just can't even get your brain wrapped around it. You just feel so dry spiritually. And you need a new beginning with God. You need, a fr you need living water. When he says, I'm going to make rivers in the wilderness, you need to feel that in your soul this morning. You need that. If that's you, then when Philip starts to lead us, would you just step out and come to the altar? 
some of our ministers and pastors will we'll be here. We pray for you. But if you, if you just want to come get on your knees, pour that out before the Lord. God, I need a new beginning. Some of you need to come to know for the very first time that the God who can do great things in your life. You see all your past failures and you feel disqualified from God's love. You're not. He loves you. He wants to work in you. If you have not made Jesus Lord of your life, now's the time. Step out. Come take somebody by the hand and go, that's me. What's God calling you to do today? Let's begin this morning, in this moment of worship, in this moment of prayer, to say, God, I'll step out into the unknown, trusting that you'll meet me there. Father, I thank you for loving us. I pray for the next few minutes. What would happen in this room would be nothing less than just our surrender to you and our responding to you. I love you and thank you in Jesus' name.